After I had my fun uh, exposing that con man and cult leader in Alabama, I decided to turn my crosshairs on some of his associates, and <laughs> fortunately, the very one that I was targeting decided to pop up and make some noise at me. Hey guys, Matt Powell here. So recently I was tuned in live listening to Aaron Ra's response to my documentary uh, entitled Science Falsely So-Called. And, you know, he told more lies in one sentence than there are words in that sentence. And I just wanted to address one of the main lies and a couple issues as well. So first off, you know, he stated that I just went out and picked the worst atheist on the street that I could find for my movie. He said, you know, Matt Powell just went out and picked the worst guy ever and made us all look bad. Well, first off, I'd just like to state that I did not just go out and choose The Raging Atheist. The Raging Atheist actually put out many videos. Actually, if you get on his channel, most of his channel's uh, videos are against me. And he put out multiple videos stating that he wanted to come and debate me in person because he lived in Michigan. And I just kind of put it off, I put it off, I put it off. But finally, you know, he put out another video and I said, well, you know what, I'm coming out with this movie. Might as well debate him for my movie, you know, because I felt it would be beneficial. And, um, you know, I would have been happy to debate any other atheist for the film, but since the raging atheist was begging me to debate him, um, and, you know, the Bible says pride goeth before the fall, the raging atheist was very proud going into that debate. And I don't believe in, in being proud. You know, the, the only pride that I have is in Christ. I'm proud to be a child of God. But the raging atheist went into that very proud. I dare it. Let's, let's see if this happens. The raging atheist is posting a challenge to Matt Powell to have a motherfucking debate, yo. If you don't remember who Matt Powell is, he's the young, spunky <laughs> preacher. You know, I challenged him in my last video to, to have a debate. He lives here in Michigan. I'm like, we can meet halfway. I wanna make it clear to Aaron that I did not go out and just choose the worst atheist that I could find for the movie. It's just, I mean, honestly, if I would have debated any other atheist, I believe that the result would have been the same because you guys are all arguing the same thing. You guys are using the same arguments. So I just want to make it clear that I would have been more than happy to debate Aaron or any other atheist, but the reason that I chose the Raging Atheist is because he reached out to me, he begged to meet up in person to have a debate, and I finally took him up on it. However you found him doesn't matter. In any case, how does that make me a liar? You have to show that what I said wasn't true and that I knew it wasn't true when I said it. But you just said yourself that you chose him because you thought it would be beneficial where it certainly would not have helped your cause had you chosen me instead. You're admitting exactly what I accused you of. I have plenty of people challenging me to debate them all the time, most of them examples of the Dunning-Kruger effect. But how would it look if I accepted a challenge from Nephilim Free and I used him to represent creationism as a whole? Should I? Would you say he speaks for you? Not that your arguments are any better than his. If you want to debate atheist philosophy, then I wouldn't be your choice. You should debate that with Dennett or Dillahunty, and they definitely use different arguments than I do. If you want to debate Big Bang cosmology, which you obviously don't know anything about, you should talk to Sean Carroll. He also has a brilliant argument as to why we know that your immortal soul cannot really exist, and he's the only one I've ever heard make that argument. But if you want to debate against evolution, especially as it contrasts with creationist pseudoscience, then I would be a better choice than any of the guys I just mentioned, brilliant though they are, even though I don't have much formal education. King Crocoduct is another good example, very good at arguing physics, which I don't touch at all. Kenneth Miller would be great for you to debate, especially since he's a textbook evolutionary biologist and a traditional Christian, and obviously has a much different perspective from mine. Even if you assembled a panel of evolutionary biologists and paleontologists, I'd still be the only one arguing from phylogeny. Even if we debate mythicism, again, I take a different tack than other mythicists do, referencing facts that I found on my own and no one else uses. So we are not all arguing the same thing or using the same arguments. And if you get somebody who is competent in the specific subject that you want to debate, the outcome will not be the same as it was it or would be if you got Sean Carroll to debate scripture instead of getting Dillahunty instead. In your case, rather than the raging atheist, I might have suggested you talk to someone like John Perry from Stated Clearly. There are plenty of people besides myself with years of experience debating the arguments that all y'all creationists use since you all argue the same thing with the same arguments that have been debunked decades if not centuries ago, yet you still repeat them. Um, he says I begged him, which is not true, 
Uh, he's lying, um, but that's what Matt Powell does. He's a liar. Obviously, but I don't lie. Creationists accuse me of lying a lot because I say things that are true, but that they don't want to accept, or because I don't interpret their sacred fables in the strange ways that they do, because it's not justified. It's surprising to me that you, Matt Powell, would dedicate your life to lies with a belief system that is entirely fraudulent, such that you could hold up a compilation of lies and call that truth, and dismiss every actual factual truth as though they were lies, because your doctrine demands that you make believe that your magic imaginary friend is real and that every, every reasonable or rational person must be a liar, regardless what evidence or logic they have or that you lack. It is surprising that your worldview depends on such deception and that your mission literally is to spread those lies, yet you don't seem to know what a lie is. Let me help you with that. Understand that a lie is misinformation or information misrepresented with deliberate intent to mislead or deceive. That describes the entirety of your movie as well as your ministry, because your worldview requires that you deceive as many people as possible in defense of your faith, which is itself nothing but a body of lies with no truth to it, nothing we can objectively show to be true. And for me, to deceive anyone would defeat my own purpose, which is to improve understanding. The only way you can do that is to seek out the flaws in your current perception and correct them. So my information has to be defensibly and verifiably accurate, where your philosophy seems to be that the ends justify the means, so that it's okay to lie in your mission to recruit devotees, because deceivers need believers, and ministers like yourself have to be both. You can't casually toss out the accusation of lying like you just did. I consider that a serious charge not to be made lightly. An honorable man would already know what I now have to explain to you, that you shouldn't ever accuse anyone of lying unless you can immediately prove two things. One, that what they said was false, and two, that they knew it was false when they claimed it to be true. It's not enough just to show that I'm wrong because I could be honestly mistaken. And then it's like when you're playing pool and you sink the cue along with the eight because even with that win, you still lose. And likewise, if you accuse someone of lying and what they said turns out to be true, then it's like when you call the hole for the winning shot and you don't sink it where you said it goes in another hole instead. You still lose. If you accuse me of lying but can't prove that I lied right then and there, then you're the liar. Prove that I was wrong and that I knew it, or that I should have known better than to say what I did. You can't meet either criteria with me because you can't even show that anything I said was false. But I can do that with you over and over again, beginning with your first assertion just now that I told more lies in one sentence than there were words in that sentence. That was you telling a lie, in fact, two in one sentence. And you got that from my critique of the convicted fraud and con man you associate with, convict number 0645-2017, you know, the willfully ignorant and uneducated charlatan who pretends to be a doctor. In my debate with him, I showed two sentences where he told as many as six lies in eight words. And not only can you not show any number of lies in any one of my sentences, you can't even name the sentence. Because everything I said was true and everything, everything you said was false and or deceptively distorted. For example. Secondly, I'd like to just state that while I was listening to their panel, their discussion about my movie, one of the things that another atheist had said on the panel really cracked me up and they admitted that it takes intelligence to create life. Check this out. We've never created life. Well, even if we did create life, wouldn't that mean there was an intelligence behind it? Well, in, in that situation, oh, yes. Stop, guys. Um, well, that situation would have had to taken place at some point in the history. But I mean, yeah, there, but there's, so you're telling me there's intelligence yep. that created life. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. Uh, even if we created life, then we would then assume that it took intelligent intelligence to create life. You know what? Fine. I'm willing to grant that whole fucking thing. I'm an atheist, and I'm willing to grant that entire argument. Sure. Make the argument from infinite regress. Cool. Let's go ahead and grant all that. Now, where is that deity, and how do we prove it's your god? One of the other things that I wanted to address as well is the fact that one of the other atheists on Aaron's panel decided to say, well, you know what? Matt Powell is right. It does take intelligence to create life. But how do you know it's your God? There was no such admission. Cyrus was only saying that even if we grant your premise, your argument from infinite regress still fails to logically justify your assumption. 
So no one admitted you were right because you're not, and you know you're not. You know you're lying about that because you also heard me clarify that explicitly. Now, if he's talking about, you know, that, that life was never created, of course, you know, Craig Venter, I think, uh, built uh, E. coli uh, strand by strand from DNA. And we know that DNA can manufacture itself. We know that how, how all the, 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 the phospholipids, how the ribonucleotides, all of these things can form uh, chemically in different environments. And now he's just going to bypass all this. And when it, what, what I want you to notice here is he tells this guy that, that nobody's ever created life. And so the guy with the folded arms is going to say nobody's ever cre created life. And so me, he might be thinking about Craig Venter's bit with E. coli or whatever else it's done since then. Maybe he knows about that. But then watch Ginger here immediately switch the story that it, it doesn't matter even if they did create life because that implies that there was some cosmic tinkerer creating life the first time. He doesn't realize that Ribonucleotides create themselves in, in contact with Montmorillonite, create RNA, and that RNA also builds DNA. He doesn't want to know that. He lives in a make-believe world. He wants to believe what he wants to believe. So you know that it only took intelligence to conduct the experiments that prove that the formation of life could occur without intelligence, naturally, incidentally, without any prior intent or design. And in fact, I produced a whole documentary on the two world religions and showing that there is only two. You know, most people think there's just billions and billions of religions, but the truth is that there's only two world religions. So if you have any questions about who God is, feel free to check out that movie. As if you would know what the truth is, or even what truth means. The truth is what the facts are, what we can show to be true. If you can't even show compelling reasons to believe it, then you can't call it truth. And on this matter... I will have to take the word of the thousands of professional theologians of the many varied and divided religions over your deliberate misrepresentation and misperception of naturalism. Understand that citing alleged facts that aren't objectively verifiable and therefore aren't really facts is a lie, as is pretending to know things that no one even can know. It is dishonest to assert unsupported speculation as though it were a matter of fact. Yet that's what all religions do, and every religion is a lie for that reason, because they all rely on the frauds, falsehoods, and fallacies of faith, the most dishonest position it is possible to have. Even if there was a God, it wouldn't be your God or anything like it, because you worship the Bible God. Actually, you worship the Bible. You worship a book that is wrong, scientifically and historically, ethically and morally. Whether God exists or not is irrelevant. Either way, evolution is still an inescapable fact of phylogeny, and the Bible is still man-made mythology. Not even the existence of your God can change either of these things. So let's not bring up any of your other movies yet. Let's focus on correcting one deceitful piece of work at a time, sticking with the vehicle of deluded propaganda we're already talking about. So let's take a quick look at your movie, Falsely So-Called, because it's really just a video that is much too long to have such low production values with a constant volley of delusional distortions, irrational assertions, and illogical conclusions, it's already a disorienting descent into madness, even without the creepy music giving the impression that we're all trapped in an insane asylum. Including Anderson in that only completes that effect. Let's just take a look at all the lies you told therein, and leave out all the misrepresentation, fabrication, and columnation told by convict number 0645-2017 and all the other ignorant hate mongers featured in your video. Because everyone in it lied over and over again. The whole movie is nothing but a long line of lies, erected like dominoes for an hour and a half of bogus and erroneous fibs and falsehoods, beginning with your implication at the very start that evolution somehow inspires criminality or inhumanity. If anyone else wants to watch your movie, I want them to notice and confirm that every single time we see your face on screen and hear your voice, you're lying. Take a look. He was the co-founder of evolution, so it shows that Ernst Haeckel and Charles Darwin were some of the most biased scientists on the face of the planet. That's three lies in two sentences. Religion is a bias by definition, but Darwin wasn't particularly religious and he certainly wasn't biased. You, Matt Powell, are much more biased than Darwin ever could be, so it's a bit hypocritical that you would make that accusation. Evolution is a process of population genetics, understood in Darwin's day as population mechanics. As such, it doesn't need a founder. Evolution was already known to be a fact for more than a hundred years before Darwin discovered, or rather realized, the first working mechanism to explain it. 
He did decades of research to confirm his theory of common ancestry before finally having to share credit with Alfred Russell Wallace, a superstitious novice who accidentally had the same idea about natural selection literally in a fever dream and without decades of study to back it up. Darwin had waited too long to publish, but this was still several years before Haeckel got involved in promoting evolution on his own. So no one founded evolution, and Haeckel wasn't involved in the formation of the theory at all. More importantly, though, Darwin was one of the least biased, least prejudiced, and most open-minded and objective scientists of his day. This is consistently and admirably reflected throughout his works, not just on the origin of species and descent of man, but right from his very first book, on the voyage of the Beagle, where he always expressed consideration for other opinions and perspectives, and he showed how he changed his mind on different matters in each of his books. So you made another assertion that is not supported by any evidence and is thus indefensible. If you don't have the evidence to back the fact, then you can't assert it as a fact, because that would be lying and not merely innocent ignorance of history. Ernst Haeckel went over to Germany and he drew these fake drawings of a human embryo and a dog embryo to make them look exactly alike. He was convicted of fraud by his own secular university. In the same textbooks that you studied in school and that any public schooler for the past 130 years has studied are from Ernst Haeckel. Here you've spoken three sentences and each one is a lie. Haeckel didn't go to Germany, he was born there. And he didn't draw a human and a dog embryo to make them look exactly the same. He used the same drawing for both in a hastily assembled first edition of his book, on the excuse that no one could tell the difference at that stage, which is true if you bear in mind that a dog's gestation is nine weeks rather than nine months, since we live five times longer than they do, and that consequently a dog's embryo at two weeks looks pretty much identical to a human embryo at four weeks, or the same developmental stage. Later editions of his book, however, corrected this with more and more accurate illustrations and labeling. Second, your allegation that Haeckel was convicted of fraud by his own university, while a popular talking point among creationists, that doesn't appear to be true either, since no one can find any record of it. I looked in the archives of his old university, and I couldn't even find an indictment, much less a trial and conviction. So it seems that all you have there is a couple of famous creationists at the time who did accuse Haeckel of fraud, and we have no indication of anything more than that, other than that he apparently defended himself in public media rather than in a court. Your third lie is that Ernst Haeckel never produced any textbooks, and every public school textbook used in the last hundred years was written after he died. Nor did he dictate the laws of embryology, which were actually defined by Karl Ernst von Baer. But von Baer didn't have any illustrations, where Haeckel, of course, did, because he was an artist first. So we used the only illustrations available from then on until the advent of microphotographs of comparative embryos, which, as anyone can see, still support the same conclusions indicated in Haeckel's drawings. It wasn't like they just went into the laboratory and just came to the conclusion that there's no God. No, they set out to prove that there is no God. They set out with a presupposition saying, all our scientific claims are going to be without God. Three sentences, four lies. Again, you are dishonestly asserting as fact things that are not evidently true, having no basis for your assertion, no documents attributing these quotes or motives, and all of the evidence is still against you. The scientific principle of methodological naturalism requires that all postulations be based on prior evidence and that they be testable and potentially falsifiable. This was established after the travesty of the Salem witch trials, such that claims of the supernatural can never be considered evidence because they can't be indicated or vindicated, verified or falsified. So the scientific method already requires that we can't evoke magic as an explanation of anything. A, a presupposition is what you've already assumed before you did any investigation. But remember that each of the men you're talking about started out with the presupposition that there is a God. Alfred Russell Wallace was a spiritualist who believed in divinely guided evolution. Ernst Haeckel identified as an evangelical Christian well into the 20th century, and Darwin himself originally studied to be an Anglican vicar. Later on, Darwin did say that he lost his faith in the Bible slowly over many years, but he did not count himself agnostic until sometime after the death of his daughter Annie in 1851. Yet, even on the origin of species, he still confessed a belief in God. Shortly after publication, he announced that he never intended to write anything atheistically, and even decades later, he still refused to identify as an atheist. In fact, he famously said that science has nothing to do with Christ, except insofar as the habit of scientific research makes a man cautious in admitting evidence. And this quote only 
shows your own hypocrisy, Mr. Powell. Would that you had the minimal standards that Darwin thought a Christian should have. You brought up Charles Darwin, and you hold to Charles Darwin. Um, I, but I, I agree with most of what I've read, yes. Okay. So Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, I've read you ever it. heard of yeah, it? I've read it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the other title of that book is? Mm, no. Okay. The other no. title of the book, and it's the original title of that book, is The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. That's the title of his book. This is another deliberate misrepresentation equating to multiple lies at once. You want to imply that Darwin was a racist when in fact all of his works tend to advocate for the rights of non-whites, except on the origin of species which doesn't talk about humanity at all. Because in the 19th century the word races was just a more convenient word to describe a lineage, specifically subspecies. And Darwin even explains this in the text if you'd only read it. And then you'd see that Darwin was not remotely racist, and that he actually argued against the idea of racial superiority. In his first book, Voyage of the Beagle, he defined savages more by their practice than by their lineage, and he said that Europeans should prefer the dark skin of Tahitians to their own comparative pallor. And he said the finest people he had ever met were Tahitians, and that the nicest man he ever knew was a free black military commander stationed in South America. Darwin abhorred every aspect of slavery, and he wrote extensively against it. He also wrote against the favoritism of Caucasian invaders and opposed the genocide of indigenous tribes, and he often criticized his own race as contrasted against darker tribes whom he frequently praised. So you are grossly distorting a 19th century colloquialism into an implication which is itself slanderous and completely contrary to the truth. I can imagine the terror that he was feeling inside of him thinking about God, thinking about having to answer to somebody, you know, this must be the case, a lot of people will say, because they know that there will be repercussions if it's not the case. Your imagination is speculation with no correlation to the situation, which is why you're always wrong about everything. This is why unsupported assertions have no more credence than the claims that have already been proven wrong. And again, Darwin's own words disprove you. I may say that the impossibility of conceiving that this grand and wondrous universe with our conscious selves arose through chance seems to me the chief argument for the existence of God. But whether this is an argument of real value, I've never been able to decide. I am aware that if we admit to a first cause, the mind still craves to know whence it came from and how it arose, nor can I overlook the difficulty from the immense amount of suffering through the world. I am induced to defer to a certain extent to the judgment of many able men who have fully believed in God. But here again I see how poor an argument this is. The safest conclusion seems to me that the whole subject is beyond the scope of men's intellect. It doesn't sound like he was nearly as terrorized as you imagined since he obviously held none of the concerns you said he did, without any justification again, I might add. If you tell a kid long enough, hey, you're an animal, you're an animal, you're an animal, eventually they're just going to break down and feel like they're worthless and that they're not made in the image of God. We can prove that humans are animals. Even your Bible says so, and it says that only our vanity prevents us from admitting this. There is a sense of oneness with all things, of belonging in knowing that we are a part of nature and not apart from it. But religious people want to pretend that they are not of this world because you'd rather live in a twisted fantasy land of pure psychotic imagination where it is somehow justified to tell children that they were born broken, dependent, and that they must beg forgiveness for being the wretched monsters that their obviously dysfunctional father made them to be or else they'll suffer a fate worse than death if they ever doubt the horrific lies being fed to them so that they never learn to think properly. This isn't just taking advantage of trusting children, this is emotional and psychological child abuse, and the best way to make someone feel worthless, if that was your intent. Rather than telling kids that they're fallen, disgusting sinners, and that they're, all their good works are just as worthless as filthy rags, tell them the truth. Tell them they have arisen from a lineage of resourceful survivors, and they'll be much better adjusted and empowered with that knowledge. Hey, the Bible says that God made us in His own image. And that's why a lot of these school shootings happen. And it's becoming more and more prevalent today as time moves on. Wait a minute. School shootings happen because God has the image of an ape? And that's strange because everything I read about the motivation for school shootings says they're almost always young men of one of three different types. 
First are those who are psychotic, acting according to some mental or behavioral pathology. Next are those who are psychopathic, narcissistic, having no empathy for others or remorse for what they do. But the most concerning are those who are traumatized, coming from abusive or dysfunctional families. Maybe they were sexually molested as children. Maybe they're sexually frustrated by having poor social skills or suffering through extreme poverty. According to the experts, being unable to achieve a satisfying romantic relationship or a sense of worth among your peers or any notable influence or importance in the community by any peaceful means seems to be the primary catalyst for most, if not all, of the wanton violence in recent years, even with killers who were always deeply religious, as many of them were, and who were never taught evolution. So once again, you made another bald-faced assertion of your own made-up statistics, misrepresented as though it were a matter of fact. Even if you weren't raised with any code of honor, which you evidently weren't, you still should know better than that. Here in the South, we call that talking out of your ass, which is a very polite way of saying you're full of shit. You lied to me. It wasn't lies, it was just bullshit. And suicide rates have skyrocketed since evolution's been taught in schools. As Mark Twain famously reported, there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. And what you just said is all of the above, because you like to make up your own nonsense and assert it as fact. But just to keep consistent, let's take a look at this graph of suicide rates in the U.S. Note that the only times that the suicide rates have ever skyrocketed was once prior to 1920, when our nation was the way the Republican Party wants it to be again, when there was no insurance or free education, nor industrial restrictions, nor environmental protections, nor food and drug administration, or housing regulations, and no unions advocating for workers' or children's rights. When the best damn country in the world was the most suck-ass place to live and where only rich, straight, white, Protestant Christian men had rights. The only other time there was a skyrocket in suicide rates was during the Great Depression. And this is when it was rather famously illegal to teach evolution in the United States. That changed in 1968 with Epperson versus Arkansas, when the Supreme Court ruled that a law making it a crime to teach evolution in public schools and state universities violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. So what happened since 1968? Well, everything went along fine until a period of inflation and recession beginning about 10 years later. Otherwise, nothing whatsoever to do with evolution. And you already know you can't show any data to support your assertion because you lied again. Children being aborted has skyrocketed ever since evolution has been brought into schools. It is curious then that of all American women getting abortions, 37.4% are Protestant Christians, 31.3% are Catholic, and 18% identify as born again or evangelical. For whatever reason, this study doesn't mention the influence of evolution at all, almost as if it's not even a factor in any of this. But it does explicitly say that Christians collectively account for 86.7% of all the abortions in the U.S. That's just one source, of course, but everyone I could find said that most of the women getting abortions are Christian and that a significant proportion of them are evangelicals. This credible source says that fundamentalist Christians from private religious schools where evolution is not taught are actually more likely to get an abortion than non-believers in public schools where evolution is taught. So once again, everything you say is wrong because you made it up as if it was a fact, which means you lied. Death and murder has skyrocketed ever since we brought it into the schools and it's infiltrating and it's messing with the minds of the young people and of the next generation. Oh, really? Here's what I said about exactly that at a prestigious Canadian conference in 2013. Child Protective Services and other agencies report a significant majority of child abusers and molesters identified as very religious, and the more religious they are, the worse offenders they are. Yet, religious people still argue that the less religious we are, the less moral we are, and that the more we abandon faith, the more violent we become, with the murder rates going up all the time. But that's not what's happening. And it doesn't take much research to see that. I found this on Wikipedia in a minute. And I couldn't find a larger version of this chart, so let's look at this one depicting violent crime. And yeah, again, we're seeing the opposite trend to what believers think it should be. And the implication is dramatically against them. Now, you'll see a spike where it, it, it's on that 7.0.0 7 line for the last time. Where is that? That's 1981, and it suddenly plummets. 
I don't think Merle Haggard gets any credit for that. That's when all those heavy metal albums were released, along with the cartoon movie of the same name. Now, what was the best years for heavy metal? It was the first half of the 1980s, correlating with a dramatic reduction in violent crime. Coincidence? Well, maybe. It could be that there were other reasons why it was you know, fun to be alive or a relatively good time to be, and resulting in that. Now, for this next peak, I'm going to cite an article in the Huffington Post. Back in the 1930s and 40s, the number of nuns, that's people claiming no religious affiliation, hovered at around 5%. They had risen to only 8% by 1990, but since then, the number of people who don't consider themselves part of any religion has increased to 20%. Claude Fisher, one of the researchers at UC, Ber uh, UC Berkeley, told reporters, this was not happening really for decades, until around 1990, when it suddenly started to take off. Now, if you look at this last steep and dramatic drop in both the males and females, that's 1994, thereabouts. What happened then? The violent crime rate dropped to unprecedented levels, I mean, not, since, not seen since the 1970s. What happened that we never recovered the violent crime, that everything suddenly got better? If you remember, this is when most people finally installed the internet. So, this deep decline in violent crime correlates with the sudden availability of unrestricted information and an inexhaustible supply of free downloadable porn. <laughs> Coincidence? <laughs> well, you got to admit that it's hard to commit violent crime when you're um, <laughs> otherwise occupied. And as a college student, I look at that and I think, wow, if they only knew the evidence, if they only knew the true science that the Bible speaks of, but also the science that is so right and so plain before their eyes. I do know the evidence, which you clearly do not, because it all stands against you, and it shows that you don't even care what the evidence is, which is why you lied in every single sentence you uttered in that movie so far. The only words of yours that I deleted here were where you repeated the same lies again that I've already corrected. Well, that's in the first part of your movie anyway. You have it divided into multiple parts, and I thought it best to tackle one of them at a time, maybe in one video like this per month. But I just want to make it clear that, yeah, they admitted that it takes intelligence to create life, and I want to thank them for giving my movie free publicity, and I want to thank them, and Richard Dawkins as well, for helping this thing to explode. You know, it's exploded online. Um, it's got over 20,000 hits just on my channel alone, not to mention the other channels that have uh, hundreds of thousands of subscribers that have shared the movie. And so I just want to say thank you guys. Uh, thank you to the atheist community for sharing this and for admitting that it takes intelligence to create life. Oh, what a life! <laughs> you think 20,000 hits is a big deal, do you? Despite everyone sharing it, it still only has roughly 20,000 views. My seven-part response, lambasting your criminally fraudulent partner in Christ, earned an average of roughly 53,000 views per video. That's 370,000 views in total, and that's just round two. So this won't be the kind of publicity you want. My exposing your inexcusable dishonesty in this video is going to get at least twice as many views as your movie ever will. And I'm only one of several people doing this because all I see are waves of other skeptics calling you out as a... Because your worldview is a lie, dependent on deception with no truth in it, it is impossible to defend creationism honestly. And published declarations of faith reveal that it is such an unreasonable position that you can't concede defeat honestly either. So you have to lie or you have to give up, where I, of course, have to be honest and open to correction. For me, for evolution, for science, accuracy and accountability are paramount, where for you none of these things even matter. I can be wrong occasionally as long as it's rare and insignificant and I have integrity enough to own and correct it immediately upon discovery, but if I ever told a lie, that would end my career, where your career would be over if you ever began to tell the truth, because your congregation doesn't want to hear that. Because you're trying to make believe and I'm trying to know better, 
so we have completely opposite philosophies. This isn't just that one of us always tells the truth and one of us always lies. It's really a matter of fact versus fantasy. So all you can do is lie. If I told one lie, I'd lose credibility forever. But you could be exposed as a fraud on national television and spend a decade in prison for fraud and still start up your old evangelical faith healing pseudoscience scam again, selling your books and videos and fake cancer drugs, beguiling the gullible to build your cult compound as if nothing ever happened. Because faith is the most dishonest position it is possible to have. With all that being said, I want to thank you guys for watching this video. And I also want to make it very clear to Aaron, I'd be more than happy to sit down with Aaron and have a cup of coffee and debate or discuss creation versus evolution. Uh, one thing I want to get out of the way right now is I will not do it over the internet. Uh, there's many atheists that want me to debate them over the internet. Um, I find that in person it's better to have a discussion that way. That's how I did it with the Raging Atheist and that's how I'll do it with any atheist in the future. If you want to have a discussion with me, feel free to meet with me in person and we'll have a discussion. I'd be happy to. You fly me up to Michigan and we'll have a cup of coffee on camera and I guarantee the result will not be the same as it was in your movie. Or, we have better restaurants and a much better climate, especially in the winter, and you'll have lots of friends here because Texas has plenty of dishonest, delusional, wanna believers who don't even want to know what the truth is. So they would happily lap up your lies like a dog licking vomit, which, to be honest, is about all your ministry amounts to.